Don't oh, do it again. Oh, we are mute. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, for real. <laughs> Sorry. Good morning. My wife has been muted this morning. Let me tell you something. I cannot be silenced. Oh, God. Not today. Oh, Lord. Of all days, I cannot be silenced. Welcome to the Soul Purpose Show. Hello, everybody. I am Keith. And I am Monica. And we are um, super excited to be here this morning. Um, this obviously is not going to be a political show uh, today because we have a very, very uh, special theme, but certainly we would be remiss if we didn't mention. First of all, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for tuning in every week on the Soul Purpose Show. We are heard uh, live on InTouch News and Facebook live streaming, YouTube, um, and, um, and we have an uh, Instagram page. Right and Facebook, Instagram, uh, Facebook, website, all the all the above. My yes. wife made a website for us. I um, tried, that, which is soulpurposeshow.com. So, uh, so we're just we're just super super excited. All right, so let's just let's get into it. Um, first of all, this was a historic week. Yes, and it it's, was, and it's technically not over yet. No, it's there's there. As I explained to someone, now I, two things. So first, I think if there, there's to be applauded that the number of people that came out to vote in this election. I that think it's correct. historic. The fact that people are engaged in the process, I think it's phenomenal. That's really what you want. Yep. Um, the other part that we talked about this morning was the fact that the, the that these states were not prepared for the major influx of people that came in to vote, which you know we can have a conversation about that, whether that's good or bad. Mm-hmm. But then the last thing is they need somebody grandma from like a Baptist church, an AME church, some church that, that the, on the trustee board yes. that counts the money. Yes. Cause this count would have been done by now. It sure would have. It's been she, finished. Look, Big Mom would have walked up in there and be like, what, what y'all on break <laughs> right. We fit, We got to count these votes. <laughs> right, right. So listen, right. we all know we're going to have a show obviously dedicated to the election. We're going to recap the election for you um, in, in, in the future. Obviously when all of the counting is done, uh, when all is said and done, but for right now, we are just super uh, thrilled and pleased that that chapter of our lives is behind us. And I think that we can safely say that we're going to be moving forward as a as a now United States yeah. uh, of America moving forward. So all of that said. So anyway, so today, well, this month, November, if you follow on our Facebook page, um, November is National Adoption Awareness Month. Um, which is, as you can see, my shirt says adoption of ministry. Um, And so for those of you all who know us personally, um, and we're pretty open publicly about it, um, Keith and I adopted our son um, five years ago. Um, And so this month in particular is super important for us because we just really always try to encourage um, people to adopt first. And then secondly, black folks to adopt, whether you're married, single, whomever, we just really are in that advocacy of adoption um, for our community. Um, so, so that, so that's what we decided that we dedicated October to HBCUs. We said, we're going to try to dedicate some shows in November to adoption since it's national adoption month. Um, and so I do, do have some statistics. Would you like to run down the statistics? I'd be, I'd be more than happy to, um, cause I know I, we both talk fast, but, um, I just, we, I think it gives some context to why we're here. Right. So yeah. there are over 122,000 children. Uh, and youth that are waiting to be adopted as we speak. Um, and they are, a lot of them are at risk of aging out of uh, a foster care without having a permanently, you know, a family connection. So uh, approximately one in five kids in the, in the foster system that are waiting to be adopted are actually teens too. And I have some exposure with, with some of them as well. Yeah. Um, and so with respect, so the numbers to me, this, these are recent numbers. So out of that 122,000, 52% are male. 48% are female, 22% are African American, 22% are Hispanic, 44% are white, and the average age of those kids, of those young people, are um, eight or is eight. Um, 11% are between 15 and 18 years old, and the average time in foster care is 31 months. Um, and one of the things that we, when Keith and I, um, made the decision to adopt was looking at. Um, the number of black children, babies up to teens who were um, in the system and waiting to be adopted. Um, and, you know, if you, look, if you look at the statistics and you do your own research, you know that black children and biracial children are disproportionately um, um, in the foster care system. And in terms of the numbers, they are, they are easier to place because there are so many black children uh, um, 
to consider up considering for an adoption. Um, but that's why we wanted to have this conversation. And so um, we have invited uh, two couples on our show who are a part of this adoption family. Uh, we have uh, Christine, David and Christine Belliard, and then we have Aaron and Jasmine Johnson. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Good, good, good. Well, we, are, we are really, really thrilled um, to have you guys on. And, and I know that not only are you a part of kind of this family of, uh, of, of, of Black adopted parents, uh, but we know that you also uh, represent um, uh, organizations that you're affiliated with. Or, or that you have started as well. So we're, we're, we're excited to just really just kind of get uh, into the conversation today. But let's just start with, um, let's just start with our own kind of personal journey because I know that, um, you know, Monica and I, like I said, we, you know, we adopted and, and we've been very open about that. Uh, and we can, we can <clears throat> share more about our story kind of as we go, uh, go along. But uh, Aaron, why don't, why don't you and Jasmine just, um, just, you know, take a moment and share with us and kind of how you came into this uh, into this space. Yeah, as with to narrow the conversation, to narrow the pinpoint the conversation a little bit more. What, when you all just why did you all select adoption? I guess is the is the is the more general question. Okay. Um. Well, we've been married almost ten years now, and about after the first year of marriage, we started to try to grow our family, um, but we struggled with infertility for about a few years and um, we would see doctors and they didn't really know what was wrong. Um, we tried the IUI, one cycle of that didn't work. Um, and we just wanted something a little more permanent. So that's what kind of pushed us to adoption rather than keep trying IUI or IVF or whatever. And you're not really guaranteed any, anything. So we just thought there was more of a guarantee with adoption. Yeah, we might have to wait, but yeah, we just felt like it was a little more secure. Um, yeah. So that's what really kind of just pushed us to adoption, you know. Um, anything else you want to add? Yeah, pretty much what she said. Um, we did consider fostering for a while. You know, when we went through that process, we were, you know, committed to the whole idea of, um, uh, what do they call it? Um, Reunification. Reunification. Um, but it just didn't work out. It wasn't for us, and really, it was probably more of a a shortcut we were trying to take. But um, you know, through circumstances, God directed us back to to adoption, and um, yeah, it, it took us a while to get there. Um, I know I can't speak for Jazz, but I know for me, it was kind of a um, you know a faith issue. Is us going to adopt? Does that mean? You know, we're not trusting that we'll be able to get pregnant and all that. But um, at some point, we just made the jump, and um, we're we're glad we did. You know, it's, you know, it's it was the the right move. Everything worked out the way it was supposed to. So that's how we got. David and Christine. Uh, well, our journeys are actually both a bit different. For me, I knew since I was a little girl that I wanted to adopt. It was just always in my heart. Um, my mom reminded me the other day, I told her when I was when I was eight years old that I wanted to adopt. Um, so I'm a family therapist and I actually ended up doing an internship working in a residential treatment center and with um, a foster care adoption agency. So I just remember, it's one thing to hear, like I'm so glad that Keith shared the statistics, to hear the statistics, it's another thing to see them, to go into where foster children are and you see faces that look like ours primarily, mm -hmm. honestly. And I remember at the time, like in my early 20s, and one of the young ladies who is in foster care, she's like, well, you say that you care so much. You're here every day. Why don't you adopt me? And I remember I'm like, well, first off, I'm barely eating. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm calling my mom for money still. <laughs> so, but I remember feeling like, you know, I'm going to come back. Um, so I connect, we really do connect with Aaron and um, Jasmine because we have been dating like what, six months. And then we found out that I um, had reproductive issues. And I remember having the conversation, like, I don't know if you want to, continue this because I may not be able to have biological children. And I remember um, David first, he's like, well, let me, I, let me think about it. And I was kind of shocked. Like, well, I thought he was going to say like, no, I'm in it. But, <laughs> but then like two minutes later, I recall back. He's like, you know what, whatever the road, I want to take it with you. And so we, um, we were trying for kids. We considered IVF. I was, I had like 
what, four or five surgeries. Some were like close to death. Oh, and um, it was just one of those things where we actually didn't actively pursue adoption. Our case came to us through foster care, um, through um, um, part of our network. And I think the rest is kind of history. Oh, and I do just have to add this. We always go on an anniversary trip every year. So we were in Cuba. And while we were there, we had like this um, ceremony that was done. And the minister said, y'all are going to have two kids. Yeah. And we were thinking it might be IVF because, you know, it's likely that you have twins. Yeah. And the next day we got the call about our children and we do, we have two children, a boy and a girl. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, our story is um, pretty similar to, to, to all of, our, I mean, all, I had, we, I had reproductive issues as well. We did two rounds of, of IVF. Um, and my husband will share, I was tempted to have to do a third round. And so keep, I have three bonus daughters. So this is the second marriage for both of us. Um, and I have three bonus daughters who are adults. And so um, Keith, in his in his wonderful, gracious, beautiful self said, okay, we'll get married, we'll do one. I can I can add one more to my roster. I can add one more child to my roster. So, um, so with the IVF, we did that. We did two rounds and they were unsuccessful. And for anybody that has done IVF, it's um it's emotionally taxing, it's physically taxing, and it's not cheap. It's it's a, it's a it's expensive. Um, but to me, the more emotional part was the negative result because you kind of you're prayerful, you're faithful, you're saying, you know, God, you give me the desires of my heart. You know, this is what I want. Um, and so the second negative result, I remember. I'm talking to my mom the other day. I remember that day very, very well. And I was angry with the result because I was like, well, I don't understand. I'm praying. I'm fasting. You know, you said you give me the desires of my heart. I don't understand. And then this man said to me. Your prayer was to be a mother. Pharaoh never was to be pregnant, and they're different. And so once he said, I, once he said that, I was like, that is correct. Because before we had never really we talked kind of about adoption. We talked about it, but it was kind of one of the options. But I really wanted the experience of being pregnant. And so my, my girlfriends and my sister-in-law were like, I don't know what she was praying for that for because it is overrated. But they, I wanted the experience of being pregnant and all of that and giving birth. Um, and so that was that. I think yeah. that was December 2014. Yeah. Yeah. And it took, and it, and it took a while. I'm, I'm, I'm just so gratified to hear, um, hear us as, as, uh, as couples uh, really kind of talk about our, um, our struggle with, uh, you know, with, with, infertility and with other um, issues because uh, and I'm curious to hear from the from the guys on this as well um, because we have been you know socialized as a culture to really just kind of keep whatever happens in our house in between us you know we keep it with us we don't we don't want to talk you know openly about it or publicly about it but the reality of it is is you know they going behind closed doors what was happening in our homes is a real is a real emotional struggle and it's an opportunity for couples to really kind of show you know your metal like what are you really like what are you really really made of so um so dave talk to us a little bit about kind of when, when during those two minutes when you had to kind of process what was what was going on what what, what was going on in, in your uh in, what was your thought process yeah you know it was more like you know should i let you know a good woman go uh, just because you know she she possibly you know couldn't re, uh, reproduce or have my child, you know, um, you know those six months of just being in a relationship with her was phenomenal, um, and I knew that God placed her with me for a reason. Um, so being able to have that two minutes just to reflect and think and ask God, um, I think I needed that um, versus making an impulse decision like okay, you know, yes or no, and then going with that. Um, but you know, I think making that move and going through that journey was, was eye opening. Um, and having our kids now has been such a blessing. Um, so it's, 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 it's it, the, the two minutes, you know, it, it, it rewarded itself. Um, and, uh, I'm blessed now to have a family with my wife. And, Cause if it would have got to three, I don't know. <laughs> So, so I do want, so I've, I've heard foster and they all, you all, you said you all, David and Christine, you all came through, your children came through fostering. Yes. And Aaron, I know we talked a little bit before the show, both of you all, both of us in terms of couples 
our children came through the private adoption space agency. Yeah. So, but Anna, I heard you mentioned fostering. Did you all do fostering at all? No, we okay. um we went through the the training and and all that, but it just it just didn't work out. Um, yeah, it yeah. just wasn't a good fit. Wasn't a good fit. Um, we 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 were we were being clearly directed back towards uh, private adoption, which is I think what we should have done from jump is just I was scared about the cost. Yeah, yeah, that really kind of just. I don't like spending a whole lot of money, up yeah. money so that really frightened me. Frightened yeah. Me. yeah. So, yeah, but we got over it. We got over it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, you know, culturally, and our show obviously focuses on issues, uh, you know, within our, within our community. But, um, but if you reflect back, you know, like a generation or two before us, um, you know, the Black family has always been very dynamic, right? So you had some situations where, you know, granddaddy has some kids over here, but then he also has some kids over here, and then he also has some kids over here. And then family get-togethers just featured this, um, you know, combination of, of people that were just kind of brought into the family. So at one point, it was really just kind of by default, we were disenfranchised as a people, and so we came to so so the family unit can, kind of came together in some non-traditional ways. I'd love to get you guys' thoughts on why is it you know today in contemporary times do we still face some of these stigmas around you know like form, formally adopting and fostering, especially with our own kids. I love that you brought up with our own kids because as we know, there's so many stereotypes about kids that um, are in need of a forever family. And I love what you're bringing up because it's true. Most of our issues are residual effects of slavery. Mm -hmm. There were slaves that had to be separated. And then whoever was left on the plantation, that had to become your family, you had to adapt. And so I think it's easy to uh, stigmatize and blame family. But as you mentioned, these are our family. And so there really are generational traumas that are happening and responses. Um, so when it comes to why is it that there are more Black kids um, proportionally in care, we can't disconnect it um, from the contextual factors. Um, so I feel like I forgot your your question. You no, asked you. why, what? I, I think you're hitting on just, just okay. the, the kind of the cultural impacts, the stigma and the perceptions exactly. around them. Like why is it that we that we that we have these kind of we still have these issues? And I and I'll give a I give a, a specific example for for me personally. So when um, when we brought my our son home and um, we had like people had like these impromptu baby showers. I remember this older woman coming up to me and she said she whispered it. She said, "I adopted my son too." Yeah. And so, and so it, 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 I, I would say, oh, it's not so wonderful. And I was excited about it, but I was kind of taken aback because the part of me was like, well, why are you, why are you whispering about the fact that you adopted your son? Because he's, for me, our son is no different than our, you know, Keith's daughters. He is our child, and he's a part of our family. Um, so, so I guess to me, that's a part. So that was a stigma. There's a, there still is a stigma associated with adoption in our community. And I really wonder if you all have any thoughts. Um, is that, I guess, is that what you're yeah. um, if you have any thoughts about why that is, I'd be interested in knowing because I, I was taken aback um, by that. I mean, just kind of continue because I just kind of like, I want to make sure I'm going the right direction. Um, I just really think that we've always adopted as I was saying, but I think formally there there is a distrust in institutions. I mean, looking at even right now, COVID, we're getting the vaccine. Well, we're thinking about Tuskegee, these things that are really a part of our DNA. So um, why would I want to bring in a system that we know can disenfranchise our children? So I think that's a part of it. And then again, I think that a lot of the stigma and shame comes from, well, we usually have someone in our family. We need to know the kids, where they come from. So I think of it actually, this is, I don't, y'all know I can go on and on, but I just think a lot of it sometimes is um, a function of white supremacy. And sometimes we're even perpetuating it. We don't recognize it. Like, oh, you're going to adopt one of those kids? Well, these are the same stereotypes that are usually about Black people. You know, well, they might be crazy. They might be this. So I think when having these conversations is so helpful to really dispel some of the myths. So, so Aaron and, um, and Jasmine, did you all have any, once you made the decision to do, to, to adopt, did you have any of those misgivings about, um, about the, about the process, about, 
I don't know, I don't know anything about the child. I don't know anything about their family history. I'm concerned about, you know, concerned about all those different things because when you have a child naturally, you bringing in whatever mess you got, whatever mess I have, and we're just creating this being with all of our mess and all of our DNA. But when you're, you're adopting a child, you are bringing in a child into your home, into your family and loving a child that you know really nothing about and know nothing about um, their family background. Do, do, were, any, were there any misgivings when you all made the decision to adopt? I kind of thought about it, yeah. Like, oh, what are we getting into? You know, at least with, at least with us, we have our family history. We kind of know what to expect. But I think talking to um, different friends, they're like, oh, you have that issue with biological kids too. You never really know what to expect either, you know? So, I mean, yeah, I think that just kind of helped me get over it. I mean, yeah. So you know, yeah. Go ahead. yeah, I think um, yeah, I think um, our workers they did a really good job of kind of helping us understand the different, and the different um, 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 what do you call it, risks or like breaking down the different categories of the type of, of the type of um, children that children may be up for adoption. Basically, just making sure we're clear on you know what you know drug use means, what that could possibly mean versus not. You know what does um, the mental health of the parent, the of what that could, what that so we, we were, I think we were, I think we were, I'm not going to say we were experts, but we were pretty well, we were pretty well educated, informed, informed about it. Informed about it. And, um, and for me personally, I mean, this kind of ties back into the previous question, but, um, I'm, I'm not adopted, but my brother is, so I was already kind of exposed to it. Um, we didn't talk about it a lot, but it wasn't a secret either. So he was just he was our brother. It wasn't, brother. It wasn't oh he's someone else's kid. He was just he was our he was our, our brother. So we didn't really for me I didn't really have that notion. I even talked to my mom a little bit like how did you feel when you brought in you know when you and dad brought in this other kid and she's like are you kidding? You know she was she was more afraid that he wouldn't love her and you know you know it is it's it's. You know, I, I guess from that, I kind of have a different view of it. I wasn't really, I wasn't really, I mean, I was, I mean, I was nervous about what could happen, but could happen. Uh, we were, I think we were well prepared. I think we were well prepared. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm, I think Monica did kind of the, you know, you know, my, I adopted my child too. I, I'm really interested in hearing from you guys um, what you've decided around how you have conversations, right? As they get older, is it like an open conversation just from the very beginning and then at, you know bring them into the conversation or you or you've got a like a date certain plan like this is the day that we're going to sit down and have a conversation or do you just go um you know without them even having to feel that that uh, that separation david christine yeah i think you know when we decided to adopt we wanted to have an open adoption um, we wanted to make sure that we were extremely transparent um, cause we've seen the horror stories of kids finding out later on in life that, you know, parents had access to their, to their original parents and never share that information. Um, and I didn't want to have that. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we'd be transparent, have them connected to their cousins, um, and, uh, you know, have that open conversation. Uh, so the, so our lived experiences with them could be the best possible and we can handle any tough conversations that they would need to have. We can be as transparent as possible. And not go around it to be able to, well, to at least feel like we're protecting, protecting them here. So I think you know, so I think we decided to do that. Yeah, yeah, we did, and um, we had the opportunity to connect with the birth family early on, even before we adopted, and we had to decide like, are we going? How, how open will we be? And as soon as we and talked to the birth family, the birth it was clear, family. this is another black family. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we talked, we had so many things in common, just we connected, we all went to eat. And not to say that there weren't challenges on both ends, because I, I don't know, I really felt that in my spirit when Aaron said that your mom was thinking, I was hoping that he would love me. You know, I think as an adopted mom, I can't speak for herself, but for me, I think that's more of a struggle. Like, so I know I had that, um, my own insecurities starting the process, I'm sure birth family did, but being able to really build that relationship, I'll never forget one of our friends said, you know what, you have to think about it. If there is family that your kid has, there's no way that's not your family. I was like, that's so good. So when you view it that way, there's some biological family members you have that uh, you're gonna be a little, just, you know, 
<laughs> interact in different ways, right? So it just kind of opened my eyes. But actually, I think we really have just become family. Um, so I know that the, you can, in our, in my opinion, you can really feel that the kids are so happy. Like our kids spend time with their birth family. The, we'll, we'll gladly say what we can do. Y'all want them? We really built that relationship. And I'm just so glad because our kids will come to us. Now, it's, I have to always say it's not lilies and roses. They're, adoption is complex. They will ask us complex questions since we don't have the answers. Birth family doesn't have the answers. Um, but I, I do agree with my husband. At least it's open where we can process with them. Yeah. How, now, how old are you all? How, are your, how old are your kids? Ooh, they act like they're about 66 and 43. <laughs> but they're uh, David, DJ, he is six, and Ava is four. Okay, okay. Um, you're, so Aaron and, and Jasmine, so what is, what is the right age to have conversations? Or do you have a, do you have conversations at all? Conversations at all? Yeah, I mean, we, we talk to our three-year-old about it kind of casually. We read books about it, and, you know. Like, Including your books. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we try to explain in their language or <laughs> right, okay. I mean, the way that they can understand like okay you didn't grow in mommy's tummy you know, yeah. you adopted you and your brother and you and your brother and, you know we don't know how much you know, he understands but you know we, well, I, well, I will, well I will share with you because our son is five and so when I wrote the so they were talking for those of you all uh, listeners who don't know uh, this is one of the books that I've written I've written two for the sole purpose of explaining to our son because like Christine said to me I think we differed in terms of we so we our adoption is open I still communicate with his birth mother um which is what she asked us to do and so I communicate I keep in contact with her and send her picture so she's updated um kind of his growth and development because I don't know and I don't know how that feels to have carried a child and then make the decision that I don't I know that I can't do this I'm gonna let someone else raise them and so he and I differed in terms of when to tell our son but we knew that we were going to tell him um and trying to find the right way to tell him and so to your point jasmine that's the whole growing in my heart and in my belly was the reason why i wrote god's promise because i knew at three which is when i first wrote that book he was three reading it to him he kind of understood but you could tell okay i, I didn't grow in mommy's belly i grew in mommy's heart he's still trying to kind of put them together but we started the conversation so he could tell his friends oh i didn't grow in my mommy's belly i grew in mommy's heart and then that developed into this book which is a little bit older because it uses the word adoption and so now this morning when we're coming in here do the show he said mommy what are you all talking about today I said, we're talking about adoption. He was like, oh, okay. And then he walked off because it's not a foreign word for him. But it's like my biggest fear was that once he put two and two together, he wouldn't love me anymore, right? And so I think, and so I think a part of it because he's not, he's not clingy, but he is definitely he's a lot. <laughs> He's definitely up under me. And I think a part of that is there's some desire to stay connected. He hasn't asked the questions about his birth mother yet, but I'm open to having those discussions. But I think just there's a fear as, a, as an adoptive mom about kind of when they come of age and put two and two together. And he has a biological sister those types of questions and I don't have the answer for those. But to Aaron, to, you know, Aaron and Jasmine's part point, Point. starting the conversation so at least it's not a foreign concept um to them i think is is super important super important well i can't say enough uh, about um what you guys have done not just uh making the decision to be adopted parents but also uh extending yourselves um out into the adopted community and uh, i know that you've started organizations uh, on your own as well and we are excited to hear uh, more about them when we come out of our um, come out of our break because we're up, and, uh, we're up on our break. So we'll stay be back tuned. after the break. Welcome back. 
Welcome to Calvin's Barbershop. You all got to see this. I don't even want to know what you're looking at on that phone. Well, you should. I was learning about the dangers of high blood pressure and that we need to get ours checked regularly. High blood pressure can increase the risk of heart attack or stroke. But this text program can help keep it at a healthy range. Just text Barbershop to 97779 to sign up. I'll get right on it as soon as I'm done with this baby panda video. <laughs> text Barbershop to 97779. A message from the American Heart Association and the Ad Council. It's important to plan ahead for emergencies, like, like the storm. storm. When it kicked in, we had a plan. We were able to get in touch with each other in no time. How to find each other. The whole experience was fine. most frightening 10 hours of my life. If there's one piece of advice I'd offer other moms out there, it's to stay calm and keep to the plan. Some parents plan ahead. Some don't. Make sure you know where to find your family in an emergency. Start your plan at ready.gov. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. You've been injured. You deserve help from an attorney that knows how to handle your injury claim. This is attorney Clinton Paris from the law office of Clinton Paris. For over a decade, I worked for insurance companies, and now I use that knowledge and experience to help people that have been injured. For a free consultation, call me, Attorney Clinton Paris, at 813-413-7924. That's 813-413-7924 or at parislawoffice.com. At the Law Office of Clinton Paris, we take the pain out of being hurt. Offices, Riverview. In Touch Radio is smooth soul. Rocking your radio on the sounds of soul. Playing your favorite R&B in Touch Radio. Wherever we go, we are about to bring on the positive vibe. Wherever we go, we are gonna do what makes us feel right. All right, welcome back. Welcome we back. We are back. We are back. We are back. So if you missed the first half of our show, um, we were we were talking to the Johnsons and the, and the Belliards about uh, if I'm mispronouncing y'all last name, just please send me okay. 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 So John, the Johnsons, <laughs> the Johnsons and the Belliard family, and we're talking about adoption. Um, and we just um, the reason we're doing uh, November is National Adoption Awareness Month, um, and we wanted to show the black faces within the adoption space because we do adopt. We adopt two, we adopt two, and we're gonna pivot right now. So the reason I asked these two people, uh, Aaron and Christine on my show specifically, um, is because, as I mentioned, I may mention at the beginning, when Keith and I, maybe I mentioned this before we started the show, we were kind of talking, when Keith and I made the decision to adopt, we felt like we were doing it by ourselves. So like, you know, I we there in terms of the resources about, you know, well, what adoption agents do I go with? Do I go foster? All of those questions that we had, there was not another couple that we could really talk to, that at least that we knew, again, because we don't talk about adoption, um, to ask them about their experience and their process. So we really were kind of going through that um, blindly, right? And so that's one of the reasons why we all, we are so open about our process because we hope that through our transparency, we are helping other people who desire to adopt as well. And you're not walking in the dark. And so I wanted to bring Chris, Christine and Aaron on because they too are at, in this a, a black adoption advocacy space. Yes. And I use advocacy for myself very timidly because I'm not as actively engaged as you all are. I just use my voice and my platform. Um, but you all have you all have created spaces um, for people of color, for black families. Um, in this adoption area. And so I want, Christine is the founder of Fab Moms, which is um, fabulous, fabulous adoptive, adoptive black moms. Okay. And then Aaron is, a, Aaron and his wife, Jasmine, are founders of What Adoption, and it is We Adopt Two, um, and that is a 501c3. So I'm going to talk to both, we want to talk to both of you all about um about your initiatives. Well, we'll come back to the money part because that's obviously that's, <laughs> that, that's the huge part. That that's is the huge part. Huge part. But please, uh, uh, David, can see, tell, tell us tell us about Fab Moms uh, and what what created that. Like, what, what was how, how how did that come about? You know, um, I so resonate with what Monica brought up as far as okay, you decide to adopt and then it's like then what? And I remember like scouring the internet, books, anything for like stories. And I saw a lot of transracial adoption stories. 
which is someone of a different race, um, primarily white people adopting black children. And I just, did, I, I related with the adoption part, but I'm like, well, what does it mean to not see myself reflected as an adoptive parent? And so um, I ended up saying, well, if there's nothing, I know I'm not the only person. So I started to slowly hear stories, make connections. And actually, Monica, I know you said you don't feel like you do a lot of advocacy. Yes, you do. Um, you're one of the first people that I found when I even was looking at a hashtag about Black adoption. With your oh, wow. Yes, yes. And um, you were so encouraging. And I just said, because a lot of people were saying, well, why are you doing fabulous adoptive Black mom? Why not just fabulous adoptive mom? And for me, my husband and I, we tried to go into so many spaces. We took our children to an adoption camp for kids of color who were adopted. So we were like, oh, these are our people. We were the only black couple there. Um, really? Husband, oh, oh, out of like 100 parents, there yeah. might have been you and another black man. Um, and anyway, so, and I think for me in that moment, I, I really was moved. And my husband will tell you, he had to console me the first night. There was a sea of black children, about 90%, about 200 kids, and about 100 parents behind them for the first program, 95% white. And I wow. think for me, it was just a moment of, not that I'm against transracial adoption, but what would it mean for more black people to see the disparity, to feel the disparity? And so I really was like, I, I can do something. I didn't know what it would be. And God really laid on my heart, the name and everything, Fabulous Adoptive Black Mom. Fabulous because a lot of times when we hear black people connected to adoption, it's negative. Mm -hmm. So I wanted the first word to be, no, this is something that can be fabulous, beautiful, celebrated adopted because obviously we are parents through adoption and then we are black because we really are trying to glean from the margin stories of black people who have adopted just like we're having this conversation this is probably one of the first conversations between three black adoptive couples that i've ever heard yeah. publicly which is a big deal um so anyway the whole point was to help encourage adoption bring awareness show the faces so if you follow us at the fab moms on instagram we always are highlighting monica was one of our first features uh, we highlight just because just like people like us, um, people can see your face and know like, oh, this is somebody like me. I'm hearing your story. Um, we also want to bring, or we do bring together black because of COVID. We we were supposed to have a fabulous retreat. It was all planned. Monica was also going to be a part, and she'll be when we get in person. But we did a virtual retreat. We're doing virtual hangouts every month. And I remember at first, I'm like, will people really come on? I was thinking it'd be two or three women. My husband will tell you most of the women. I mean, I'm not in COVID, but we really are sisters. Yeah. Um, because you just know when you meet someone, you have that shared experience. We are also a 501c3. Our hope is to really center the voices of adoptees. Because when I went to the adoption camp, what really struck me were the transracial adoptees who are Black adopted by white parents. And they talked about how they most of them will publicly tell you, I love my parents, but I wish I had a Black parent. Mm -hmm. I wish there was someone to guide me in being Black. So again, I just, um, with Fab Moms, the hope is to encourage more Black people to adopt and support the ones that do. Yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. And and Aaron and Jasmine, um, you, we know you know we know you guys are also a, a registered five hundred one c three, but you have a very specific mission. And we I know we talked about the money and the cost, which is uh, makes it prohibitive. Tell us about what um, what tell us about what what is. <laughs> what what is what, what is all about. So, as you mentioned, we're a 501c3 uh, nonprofit. Um, I'll kind of jump back to the beginning how I got into it, and I'll fast forward. So, similar to everyone here, when we went through the process, we noticed that, you know, the in all the sample profile books, both hard copies and online, all the families were white, pretty much. Um, but we saw, noticed that a lot of the kids were black, just like Christine was saying. And that stood out to me. I asked our workers, is this the norm? They said, yes, it is. I asked, well, what are, what's being done to change that? And pretty much the answer was nothing. Um, that stood with me, that stuck with me, but I didn't really do anything about it with our first adoption, but it still could have kind of stuck with me. And, um, but when I was, when we were doing our first adoption, I was looking into grants and and that sort of thing to help um, pay for the adoption. Because for those of you out there, you may not know, private adoption is, is very, very expensive. Um, mm -hmm. It's and not just for black people, but just for everybody. You, it's, it's expensive. So I'm thinking, <clears throat> excuse me, since there's clearly a need for black, you know, families to adopt, you know, that's another thing that agency work, workers told me, you know, that, um, 
black birth parents often, often specifically request black families, but they don't have a pool of black families to choose from. So anyway, with that in mind, I'm thinking, okay, surely somebody has created some kind of adoption grant program specifically for us to help encourage us to adopt or some kind of program. Because I've seen specific grants for people who are adopting special needs and I probably saw something for a transgression. I can't remember. But it, basically, I've seen different grants, different programs geared towards different types of adoptions, but nothing specifically for black parents adopting black kids. So it kind of stuck with me. I didn't do anything after our first adoption. But then fast forward to 2019, um, when we were in the process of adopting our, our second son. Um, shortly after that, I got a hold of a book our friend wrote. She's a... Um, nonprofit lawyer and I, I read through the book about starting a nonprofit and it just kind of I don't know it just kind of clicked I guess you can say it's something that this is something practical I can actually do because you know my, my, my wife will tell you I'm not really a you know activist go march go it's just it's for me it's just purely practical it's like yeah. I, I'm gonna do something so I just like okay sure let me start this nonprofit what which you know back to what we do is our goal is pretty straightforward to provide adoption grants specifically for black families trying to adopt. And um, I guess it could potentially change in the future. But right now, what we're holding to is we want to give a minimum of $5,000 per grant. We just put in the mail last week our first grant. So we're back down to... <laughs> So we're, we're back down to zero, so we're in, in fundraising mode. But um, but yeah, the reason we chose five thousand is, as I said before, you know it it's expensive when you do the private route. Now a lot of people, you know, have told me, you know, why don't you adopt to the, you know, system or or whatever, which is which is fine. There, you know, you read the stats. There's a lot of um, children in the system that need to be adopted. Older children. But it's not just that, you know, they also need to be adopted through private adoption. Most is typically, you know, domestic infant, which is what we did, some international. It's not a either or private versus foster. They need more of us in both spaces. Yeah, they do. Um, but anyway, um, it's expensive. We decided as myself and the board to do 5000 because anything else really won't impact the cost that much. We thought about, well, what if we do a, a bunch of $500, $1,000? does not even cover the home study. Mm -mm. So we're like, yeah, maybe we won't initially be able to give out as many, but we want to make sure every grant we give out has a significant impact. Um, so that's what we do. We, we give out um, adoption grants and, and also just kind of it kind of morphed into a little bit more than that. You know, we try to use our social media to promote um, black adoption. And um, I don't know if we'll be able to yeah. talk a little bit about You're this. Pivoting, You're pivoting very, You're pivoting very well. well. You had a question. No, so yeah, so no, this, this, the information is, is outstanding. We want to make sure that we get the information on our site um, as well, and you guys' sites on our site so that we can continue to, to, uh, to, spread, the, uh, to spread the word. But I don't want, but I don't want us to get away from this uh, adoption, transracial. the tra and trans transracial as well. So, and David, I know you and I are uh, both members of a Black Greek letter organization, and we both have very strong um, initiatives around mentoring. You know, young young black young black men, and um, and so I'm I'm curious to hear your perspective on what do you what do you, like what do you see when when um, when a young black child or children need loving parents and those parents don't look like us, like, like what kind of things kind of go through, you know, go through your mind? Yeah. You know, you know, my, my, the first thing that goes to my mind is how could you procreate and not want to take care of your own, mm -hmm. uh, you know? And, you know, so for me, it's like, how can I do more to be able to help out kids in those situations? Um, being a part of you know the, the mentorship program uh, with my fraternity, and then trying to expose my kids to be a part of those things so they can be able to, when they grow up, be a, a lending hand, is something that you know uh, I see myself doing in the future. 
Outstanding. So, so Aaron, you talked about, um, I know before the show, um, you talked about um, other organizations and other groups that are in this adoption advocacy space. And I'm going, Christine told me I'm an advocate. I'm going to tell you, Aaron, you were an advocate. Cause as I told you, I wish that you were around when Keith and five years ago, when Keith and I were like, okay, so where are we pulling this, where are we pulling this money for, from? But I will tell you, cause I'm a person of faith that he makes everything perfect. So I know that was a concern of ours, but once this, once God put it on him, that you asked to be a mother and not be pregnant, everything else kind of fell in line. And so we made that decision January, 2015, nine months later, October 12th, we got our phone call, right? But in that process, there were concerns about, well, you know, we do decent, but we're not independently wealthy. Where are we pulling twenty, thirty thousand dollars from to, to pay for adoption? And we had gone through IVF, so and and we had already paid for two rounds of IVF, right? So we, the Lord is God is good because we could be making <laughs> cheese sandwiches. So 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 you talk about other spaces in other organ um, groups in this adoption advocacy, and I know you t- we talked before the show about. Um, the Black Adoption, is Adoptive or Adoption Collective? Adoption. Adoption, okay. So tell me, I know Christine, I think you were instrumental in starting that. What is, and I know that Aaron's a part of it, what is the Black Adoptive, Adoption, sorry, Black Adoption Collective? What is that? Well, Christine, she could, she could feel free to jump in because she pulled it all together, but when we're still trying to, you know, define it, but it's, it's just a group of Blacks in the adoption spaces. I guess we kind of represent um, the adoptive parents, but there's some black adoptees that are part of the space. Um, I, I don't think any of the groups that we specifically collaborated with are, are centered towards the, the birth families, but I know that's pe- some people we want to bring into it. Mm-hmm. And um, again, we're still working it out, what everything we're going to do. We have some ideas, but it's essentially we're just trying to get our voices out there. Uh, which is why it's great that things kind of worked out that we came together right before National Adoption Month because if you check out our social media, we've all been plugging each other's um, stuff, including a um, a virtual summit next Saturday. Uh, We can talk more about that later. But um, yeah, we're we're just, again, we're figuring everything out, but we're just trying to get our voices out there from all sides of the um, adoption triad, but from a, you know, Black perspective. Yeah. Um, Christine, yeah, have- and I love what you mentioned, Aaron, with what we're um, trying to figure it out. If you think about it, in, in my opinion, I think a lot of times as Black people, we're in a position of we're trying to figure it out, okay? Mm-hmm. And so I think it's a parallel process. For me, the reason why I said, hmm, before National Adoption Awareness Month, let's see if we could bring these voices together. So when I entered this space with Fab Moms, I would just happen upon if it's Monica and her book, if it's an adoptee who is like spitting wisdom, if it's but I, I just would tell someone about it, like, oh, have y'all heard about this person? It's like, no, okay, let me, and it just seemed like we were in the margin. Mm-hmm. So it really came to me, how can we censor our own voices, not wait for someone to say, hey, we want to hear from you all. So I just said, those that I've connected with, I just honestly put people on a uh, direct message. And I'm like, hey, I have this idea. November 1st, we hit it hard. We have a conversation about Black um, people connected to adoption in our work. Because there are, this is the thing too, it's not that we just adopt. We also are, com- we're a community and we're a communal yeah. people. And it's important to allow people to know that they are not the only ones, that there are organizations, there are people that are here and have and have been doing the work way prior to all of us. So anyway, um, everyone immediately was like, yes, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. So November 1st, we um, had a conversation. We had, um, I think it's close to a hundred people. We had birth- it was over a hundred. Um, yes, birth family members, p- adoption professionals, adoptive parents, and to me, the most important voices, the adoptees. Yeah. Um, we, um, share, and that was critical um, with this Black Adoption Collective. How do we center adoptees' voices? Because yes, with adoptive parents, we do. We parent the adoptee, but our kids, they are going to grow up. So how can mm-hmm. we hear from those who have been parented, who are adopted, and there are so many adoptees who are Black, if it's transracially. So we have people in the Black Adoption Collective who were um, transracially adopted, adopted by Black people, um, some that were in open adoption, some not, some in reunification, some not, some that found out later they were adopted, some from birth. So 
I just recommend follow at Black Adoption Collective because as Erin mentioned, we really do highlight what's going on, um, the pages you should follow, um, statistics that you'll wanna know about. And I just wanna also say, adoption is so complex, even amongst Black people, even us, all of us here adopted in different ways, mm -hmm. at different ages, different um, stages of life, what have you. And so I just, I just in case I don't get a chance, I have to say this when we talk about the financial aspect, for us, we were considering IVF. That was our hope. And we were trying to get our pennies together. And I really did not know how, how um, little we knew about foster care. I just have to say, we didn't pay $1 to adopt. So if someone is listening and saying, oh, but I, I can't afford it. There is another avenue of foster care. A lot of children are already legally free, which means they need a home. Mm -hmm. they, so it's not as if, sometimes there's this um, idea that we're getting in the way of family reunification, but there are kids that are literally hoping for a home. So I just wanted to put that out there. Oh, and, and, that, and, that's, and that's really good because I know one of our, one of my really, really good friends um, from college, her and her husband were foster um, parents to uh, lots of uh, maybe four or six little boys. Mm -hmm. And then their, their son, their son now, who is just, I mean, he is, he should wow. really be like, have his own show because yeah. he is so charismatic. Um, but they adopted him through the, through the foster, mm -hmm. through the foster care system. And she's a, she's a, he's a minister. So they advocate, they really advocate in that space to, for exactly the same reason, Christine, because sometimes it, it is, um, economically just not feasible for folks to pay a private adoption and to really give some consideration to fostering. Cause a lot of those babies really want to just someone to hug them and love them. Mm -hmm. And she said, when you, when they come in, they've been moved from house to house. It takes a, that's why I have this shirt, adoption is a ministry, because the, regardless of where, how old your child is, when you adopt them or when you bring them in, adoption is not for everybody. It is right. not that's for every family, because you really have to navigate that space very delicately. Just like fostering, adoption is not for everybody, fostering is not for everybody. And I recognized early that fostering wasn't for me because I love kids so much. And while I recognize reunification absolutely is the goal, it would be very challenging for me to bring a one-year-old in my house and love on them and care for them for two to three years once their family is able to be reunited and then they're gone. That would be heartbreaking for me, even though I know going in that that's the goal. So well, I just want to say to that, there is, so and you have to check your state, but in many states there is, yes, you can become a foster parent where the goal is family reunification. But in almost most states right now, there's so many kids that are already legally free where family mm -hmm. education is not the goal. Yeah. And there's a myth that um, you're only able to adopt a teenager. And there are a lot of teenagers. And the hope is that we can have people adopt teenagers. But unfortunately, with um, opioid crisis, uh, crisis and a number of others, there are babies that need mm -hmm. homes. There are um, toddlers. The age range is wide. Um, but I just want to also state that, like, for us, we, didn't, we weren't like traditional foster parents. We were already matched with our kids and then we had to go through the process of adopting them. Um, then I just want to say with foster care, just to advocate a bit, um, not only did we not pay for adoption, but our kids will also go to college for free in our state, um, right. any of the state schools, um, all the way up until the age of 28. And then monthly we do receive a stipend and they have free health insurance until they're 18. Mm -hmm. And I bring that up because as African, yeah, college tuition, I bring up as, as African Americans, sometimes when we think about our disparities, education is a big thing. So to know that your child will is uh, able, you already know, to go to college for free, that's major. So I just want to bring that up because I know I didn't know that until I think right before we adopted. That's awesome. And I just and I just found that out like uh, about two seconds ago. When right. you said it, so <laughs> that's no, that's that is that is that's awesome. Really good information. So have. so so Jasmine, I know we're coming up. Um, we got a few minutes before we break. I would like for you. I would like to give you the opportunity to give. Uh, a testimonial for an, another, you know, young black mom to be who's considering adopting. I would like for you to give kind of your own testimony as to why she should consider going there. As to why she should consider adopting or replacing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> um. I think with, um, at least with a good agency, she'll have a lot of 
good resources and people to help her. And then like with our agency, um, they do a lot of help with the birth moms and providing counseling and whatnot. Um, so there is that to look forward to. Um, with adoption, or if she does decide to place with adoption, she doesn't have, it's more permanent. She won't have to worry about like with foster care, jumping from house to house um, mm -hmm. and just not knowing what to expect for her child. Um, she can also make the decision to be open um, mm -hmm. and have, you know, contact and communication with the family and her child, kind of see it grow up. Doesn't mean that she has, you know, just placing a child for adoption doesn't mean you have to never see them again. Yeah. Um, so you can, you know, request open adoption if that's, you know, if that's her will, if that's her choice. Um, yeah. Well, it sounds like you're here for the resources available. Um, yeah, you're not, you're not you can like, have somebody there to kind of help them, you know, get their adoption plan together and, you know, they won't have to go through it alone. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Well, this has been, um, this has been a phenomenal conversation. I think we probably have a minute left before we, before we're wrapping up. I just, I want to sincerely thank, I would love to get together again to do this. And I would also, because we are all close, we're not that far apart. We all should get together because our kids are around the same, our children are around the same age. So that is the beauty of this and that we are a community and our children can, um, cause I've said this and not that biological children aren't special. Um, but I have said this about our son. There is something and when him and all my girlfriend's son get together, yeah. There is something done. It's like they know. It's like they know. And so I've, I've shared, we've shared with our son, you can do anything that you want. And he says, because he's competitive, he told us, he said, you know, mommy, babies that are born in hearts are much better than babies that are born in bellies. <laughs> I said, well, it's much better. It's just different. He said, no, we're better. And then he walked off. And so, and so I, I, I think we are both just a tremendously blessed. He wakes up happy. I get emotional every time I think about it. He wakes up happy every morning, every day. Mm -hmm. Sunshine, there's no rain. It's sunshine from the moment. It's sunshine and talkativeness from the moment he wakes up, the moment he goes to sleep. So, so I say all that to say to anybody that is considering adoption um, or even fostering, recognizing that as much of a blessing as we are to them, I can honestly say that our son is absolutely a blessing to our family because he it's not even he completes it he just kind of takes it over yeah. <laughs> he just takes it over so so this has been this so is, listen, go ahead. I, I want you guys to, um, to, to talk about the upcoming event though as we oh the, yeah yeah um, virtual summit organization uh, called yes we adopt um, that's the organization's name um, I'm blanking out I have to, I'm trying to see if I can find the flyer but there's a virtual summit um, next Saturday. The 14th. It's um, from 10 to 2. The great thing is they're going to have a panel of uh, Black adoptive dads. I think, Erin, you're on the panel, yes. right? And so is David. So y'all can see more from them. Um, they're going to have a panel of adoptees. They're going to have a panel for adoptive parents, a panel for those who work in adoption. So it really will be, one, something that's never happened to bring voices connected to adoption together um, for a powerful conversation and a birth mom panel. So I'm really excited. Oh, wow. Yeah, it'll be great. You can register. Um, Yesweadopt.org, I believe is the website. I'm, I'm sure you all can post these. Yeah, yesweadopt.com right? um, slash summit. Slash summit. It'll be great. So shout out to Fab Mom Stacy. She is um, the founder of Yes We Adopt, and she and her husband are doing amazing things as well. If we're plugging things, can I please um, just share? Fab Miles, we're hosting two events for National Adoption Awareness Month. One is next Thursday. I recommend everyone attend. We have the Dr. June P. Murray. She was adopted in the year, you're not going to believe it, 1943. She has wow. wisdom. She's an adoption worker, professor. She's amazing. So um, you can find the information on any of our um, platforms. And then on November 22nd, if you're interested in adopting, we are having a Fab Mom 101. We'll go uh, live from our Facebook page. Come and ask all your questions. We'll share our stories. We'll be a panel of Fab Moms. I just want to add Outstanding. Thank you guys Thank so much. Thank you all so much. much. And Thank congratulations, President-elect Biden and President, <laughs> Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. Be safe. Enjoy Be safe. the rest of your week. Thank Bye. You Thank you all. Thank you.